Welcome back to the competition studio at the International Paderewski Piano Competition. It's November the 16th, and I'm delighted to have a surprise guest with us today, Hanna Kulente, the composer of the commissioned work of the competition. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you for being with us. I'd love to ask a million different questions. It's so hard to find the right one to ask a composer <laughs> because I'm so interested in so many topics. We've been hearing your piece, Atlantis Solo, mm -hmm. but you have written many other pieces and many other commissions. Yes, of course. My, my, my musical life, it's r writing music and uh, I combine it with, of course, with the commission, commissions. Mm -hmm. And you're a Polish composer, but you live also in other parts of Europe. Yeah, I am also Dutch, so I lived half of my life in Holland, in Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And now I live uh, partly in France. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time here in Warsaw, and yeah. uh, I teach in the, in the Big Coast. I'm professor You are a professor of composition yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So I have my composition class. Okay. So it goes, and writing music. And <laughs> so what kinds of commissions have you done? Oh, many, many. If you if you look on, on my website, so all the pieces I wrote for commissions and different from from solo orchestras, uh, mm. ensemble, chamber music, uh, operas, mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah, and solo music like now for this uh, Paderewski uh, concours. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And when you were writing uh, commissions, usually you have a lot of time to do them. You get a lot of uh, opportunity to spend time drafting them and preparing this composition. Yeah, well, I write by hand. So for me, it's wow. just a question to write these notes. Mm -hmm. For one instrument, it's easy because you don't have so many notes. So right. you don't need so, so much time. But for orchestra pieces, of course, I have to fill in. So mm -hmm. it takes time and my publisher has to make parts and a score, printed score. Mm -hmm. But normally, let's say symphonic works uh, from three till six months something wow like this. and the work for this competition atlantis solo atlantis how? solo it's a short piece of few days maybe few, few days, days. <laughs> <laughs> and you write it you compose at the piano uh, well I, I, this is very special because um I use my in improvising works, mm -hmm. you can also find on the YouTube so mm -hmm. I have some titles improvising music and later I give live let's say for chamber, for piano versus and saxophone, or hmm. piano and flute, or piano solo, and orchestra versions. Yeah. So in this case, it's Atlantis. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have piano solo version, mm -hmm. which had premiere, Atlantis Duo. So it's a piano, flute, or clarinet, or soprano saxophone. I'm going to write also a symphonic version with the two instruments, piano, saxophone, and orchestra. I had also uh, aestheticos, uh, mm -hmm. so it's a soprano, saxophone, piano, and orchestra. You can also find it on YouTube. Okay, great. Uh, also the chamber version only for two instruments. Alinea, mm -hmm. you can find it. My improvisation, I have to make still a written version for piano and mm -hmm. maybe saxophone. But on the YouTube is Alinea, Alinea, double title. Yeah. So I, I improvise and there is uh, Alinea just Alinea for clarinet, piano and orchestra. Mm -hmm. So I have fun to write yeah. music, to, to, to improvise and later mm -hmm. to, to, to make a piece. And uh, Atlantis solo, of course, I, I couldn't play so so fast like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you so will, if I understand you correctly, you're going to turn Atlantis solo into a piece for orchestra as well. Yeah, yeah, because I, uh, uh, I think it's nice material. It and, is, yeah. yeah. And uh, I want to make um, actually for two instruments, for soprano, saxophone and piano mm -hmm. and orchestra. For you, what's the most interesting instruments to write for? Uh, doesn't matter, you know. Mm. Uh, um, two years ago, I had a commission for pan flout and orchestra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would never choose myself pan flout. Yeah. Pan flute. <laughs> the pan, no, the pan, pan flute, flute, yeah. But uh, that's a great... Uh, uh, Pan flutist uh, Matthias mm -hmm. uh, Kunet, he's Dutch mm -hmm. and uh, he played it fantastic. So at Umbro, you yeah. can also um, listen to from the YouTube. And when you start to plan a composition, is it the music that comes to you or you think about the instruments you want to write uh, for? Of course, it's a combination because when I know for who I write music, so of course. And uh, most of the time I, I write for people, they want to, to play my music, perform my music, commission yeah. my music, right. yes. So it's, uh, of course, it's combination and uh, um, thinking about this 
people, these persons, but mm -hmm. also combine my style because I have new musical style. I call it myself music surrealist, uh, mm. uh, surre surrealistic music, new surrealism, and uh, surrealism. Yeah, new yeah. surrealism. So wow. I started this. Here. And is Atlantis solo in this style? Yeah, of it's, uh, it's it yeah. It, this is too short this piece to to to, to say, but. Even you have uh, some some passages, some elements going like in the in the loop, you know, like mm, like uh -huh. and then you jump to to another uh, uh, sort of emotion. But mm. in, in the other pieces, um, like even Alinea uh, for orchestra uh, at Umbro, you know, the, this recent pieces, uh, you can see. This, this surrealism, uh, it's very difficult to explain, uh, but uh, I would say very shortly, it's like, like you go on the serpentines uh, with, mm. a, with a, a car and you never go what will come from, from the corner. So ah. you know the aim, mm -hmm. but you never know what will happen on the way. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And I combine different times, like uh, I'm the G DJ on the mixing thing, you know, <laughs> and uh, here's the one emotion. One time, second time, you know, mm -hmm. like we speak now very, very fast and I will speak very, very slowly. You also listen and wait for, mm -hmm. for the next uh, word, for the next syllable. Yeah. So next letter, you know, is attention. So this combination of time. I think dimensions. we're very interested then to hear when you hear a composition for the first time that you have written, like at the competition, mm -hmm. you're hearing Atlantis solo for the first time. Yeah. What are your, some ten of your times. impressions? Ten times. <laughs> the ten semi-finalists all played it. What do you think? Uh, well, first of all, that I wrote good piece, I think. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> and uh, second, yeah, I'm really surprised by different uh, versions, different, different uh, uh, interpretations. interpretations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, it's very nice. I mean... Uh, some things I would never think that it would work, like for instance, mm. starting very slowly. I wrote it just from the beginning, 160, you know, so mm -hmm. it has to be very fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, to make the, the differences between these, these elements, you know, these, these waves like, and the, this, this chord, um, ta -ta, um, ta -ta, um, ta -ta, and then yeah. these passages, you know, so like, like a puzzles, indeed mixing theme, you know, so it has to be played very, very fast. Right. But first as the Japanese girl today, mm -hmm. she proposed version, which I like too. She started very slowly mm -hmm. and then she, she, she made it faster and faster and faster. So she created right. very interesting form. Mm -hmm. But that means when you wrote it and you put the metronome marking there, 160 yeah, well, something, 160. you really thought this yeah. is the tempo. Yeah, this is the tempo. So when you first hear someone play it, it's much slower or it's much yeah, different. Yeah, so first think, it's like, oh shit, oh, <laughs> but it goes, you know? And you like it as it develops, yeah? I like yeah? it, yes, 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 because they make this accelerando mm -hmm. uh, finally and... Uh, and, uh, so finally, there can be some uh, differences between the performer's uh, interpretation and what you have written, sure. and you might accept this. Sure, because well, I didn't have any any repetition with this this these people. Like so rehearsal. I, uh, rehearsals, yeah. Uh -huh. So I did. I couldn't say that you have to play in this way on this way. Normally, I always say, mm -hmm, and uh, mm -hmm. it has to be played not in a romantic style, but very very cool, very very staccato, not so much pedal, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not not so romantic. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so then, some performances probably that you liked because not everyone was playing so romantically this piece. No. A little bit jazzy, a exactly. little bit in the style of improvising okay. and fast. Were there some performances that that worked? You liked it. First of all, I I liked all of them. Okay. So that's good. <laughs> yes, really, because I was listening with with the pleasure, and I, I I'm happy to have this opportunity, and I wish that these people will play my music all over the world. Mm. But if I should uh, choose someone who's uh, uh, nearby my interpretation, what I had in my he head, mm -hmm. I would choose the, the last performers, this, this Ukraine. Sanko, yeah, I yeah. think, yeah? Yeah. What was it was it? exactly what I wanted, so fast and making these plans, you know, with, uh, mm -hmm. with articulation, with dynamic, mm -hmm. and also with the, with the pedal. Mm -hmm. He played very cool, but, you know, so these layers, I, I, it was really uh, very 
very visual, vi yeah. vis visual. Mm -hmm. visual, visual, absolutely. Visible. Yeah. So you enjoyed this performance? Uh, absolutely. And, yeah. I was wow. That is, if I could play <laughs> like so fast, <laughs> I would do it. Yes. So when you uh, when you're composing for piano, so you can play piano and you improvise yeah. some things, and you also uh, then have to organize it. So finally, your music is it more improvising or more organized? You know, when you improvise music, that's like very sh very fast composition. You have no time to to to, to go back on to in zoom you know mm -hmm. to, to, to work with the elements like for instance this improvisation that i could make these loops you know a few mm -hmm. times and okay let's do it you know so uh, i have yeah. time to write it down but when i improvise the one time you know the things what i have let's say under the fingers mm -hmm. which i normally use uh, uh, doing my improvisation but yeah. here i could really do it uh, Different, different yeah. to have just to spend more time with this, and yeah. I'm very glad about it. So it's great that we got to hear your piece and that you were commissioned to write for the Paderewski competition. Yeah, when I heard it, uh, it was of course it was mm, big pleasure. Maybe now we can listen to this performance of Sayenkos yeah. of your piece. I'd like all of you to hear this performance. It happened not even an hour ago of uh, the Ukrainian pianist here. The surname is Sayenko. Maybe we can have this fragment of uh, his performance of Aldantis solo.
Welcome back. Uh, that was Carol Leone, uh, and she's my guest joining us live from Dallas, Texas. She's the head of piano at Southern Methodist University's Meadows School of the Arts. Welcome, Carol. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here with you, Jared. Yeah, thanks for being with us. Um, you know, we were talking before uh, with Hannah Kulente about uh, her composition, and the, the main theme for the studio in the last couple of days is how as the competitors advance in the competition, they have to adapt uh, to a new composition, to a concerto, new demands are thrown at them, they're getting a bit more tired. Um, well, I mean, I can't speak for all of them, but some of them might be getting a bit tired as the competition goes on. Uh, but there's also in the career of a pianist the need to constantly adapt to different pianos. And we were just listening to you play a Steinway that we all recognize, oh, that's a Steinway, but there's something else interesting about it. And maybe you could tell us what that is. Yes, that Steinway for that performance was fitted with keys that are narrower than the conventional piano keys. Okay. So um, basically, it, that piano has three different actions, and the technician just puts in the action uh, with the size keyboard that the pianist wants to play. So of course it has a conventional action, mm -hmm. and that is an octave size of six and a half inches. Hmm. And then it has two other keyboards one that's a half inch smaller octave, and then another that's even a half inch smaller than that. So we have an octave of five and a half inches, six inches, or six and a half inches. Now, uh, the, first re the first thing I wanna ask you, why is this important? What does this offer for pianists? Well, I would say the first thing that a pianist would um, be excited about would be expansion of repertoire. Mm -hmm. So. Most pianists will tell you that they would like to have larger hands. If I walk into a room of uh, university students and just ask them, raise your hands if you think you would like to have larger hands, three quarters or more will raise their hands. And yes, of course. Right. And, so, um, and that's because the conventional keyboard is designed for a large hand span. And of course, only a small percentage of pianists actually have that large hand span. Right. So, so we're talking about being able to expand the repertoire of a, a majority of pianists mm -hmm. and have musical and technical outcomes when doing so. So mm -hmm. some, you know, you know, as a teacher yourself, of course, that there are many young, talented pianists that are somewhat limited in the repertoire that they can choose. Right. Now, you've been teaching for more than 40 years, but you also have a performing career. Can you tell us about what your process was like as you were entering the profession after competing and making concerts, uh, adapting to different pianos that had keyboards that were, I mean, I don't know how you want to describe it, uncomfortable for your own hand span, or was this a painful process for you? Yes, and you know, it wasn't something at the time that was really discussed. Um, hmm. and. And, you know, even performance injury was a little bit taboo uh, right. at the time I was a university student and coming out of that. Um, and so, you know, and even And you today, went to Curtis, right? Yes, I did. Mm. I uh, studied with a Polish professor, right? Uh, Mieszysław Horszowski. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, so I, I was actually getting um, some pain from performing large scale romantic works and, you know, sort of blaming myself, not really understanding that it was actually the instrument that was not fitting me and feeling um, you know, a little bit of shame that maybe my hands weren't fitting the instrument. Right. And, you know, so, uh, yes. So I started, you know, of course, uh, finding that repertoire that I was comfortable with mm -hmm. and a certain repertoire that, um, you know, did you have to not play stuff that you really did want to play? Of course, yes. <laughs> it wasn't really until I got these keyboards that I started playing Rachmaninoff. Um, wow. And, and I really didn't play very much uh, Liszt. There were certain Chopin etudes that I wouldn't dare to touch because I knew I would injure myself. Such as? Oh, like double sixths, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Octaves, probably. <laughs> 
Right. Yeah. And, you know, so my hand is, you know, I would say it is small. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, yeah. And there are, there are different ways to have a small hand span. You can actually have long fingers and still have a small hand span. Right. Because, you know, it depends on how much your hand opens up. Apparently Chopin's hand just, you know, opened up just like a fan. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's this, issue between one and five, but also the issue between two and five. Right. So for instance, you know, to play the um, coda of the G minor ballad, you need to be able to play not only, a, you know, a good octave, of course, but also a major sixth between two and five exactly. while, play, while playing the octave. And so that can be a, a real problem. And of course, these tendons are bundled up together right here as this causes people to have a lot of injuries right in here. Have you, through the use of these narrower keyboards uh, at the university where you teach, been able to see good results from students practicing on smaller or narrower keys? Absolutely. So, um, first of all, there are, you know, the musical and technical outcomes, which are really improved. Um, but also mm-hmm. there are, um, you know, performance injuries that, you know, I've actually seen just, he- they're healed, these students, when they're, they stop wow. practicing um, with their hands fully extended, you know, and start to actually play in a more anatomically neutral position. Right, rather than of, stretched and constantly tense, right? Mm-hmm. So we have this hyper abduction of the thumb and fifth finger, which is really bad, mm-hmm. and causes tension all the way up and causes just, a, a, you know, a myriad of problems. So once they start to practice and get the feel of, oh, actually can relax. I don't need to reach out for that. Now, of right. course, there are techniques that you can, you know, the many fine techniques that you can learn to play more healthily on, on the conventional keyboard. But that, there's, that is limited. Right. You can only go so far. Um, if at the end, still, of your, if the end of the day your hand is still a certain span, no technique is going to extend that with an extra inch or two on the palm, right? Exactly. Right. Yes. So you can you can do things to keep yourself from being injured. Mm -hmm. However, um, you're not going to be able to play a tenth just because you you learned that good technique. You know, you have a tenth or you don't. Um, (laughs) So you're presenting these keyboards as a very good option for people whose hands may uh, be limited or they feel limited on a standard size keyboard. But what about the opposite argument that says, well, if you're going to go to a major competition or if you're going to start concertizing and you have to carry around your own keyboard, that's incredibly expensive. It's not practical to train students this way and then force them then later to adapt to the standard size keyboards in the profession. Right. Well, of course, I'm looking forward to a day in which these keyboards are going to proliferate and they will be available at competitions. And in fact, we did make it available at the Dallas international piano competition wow um we even had a yes we even had a student come from boston um she said i'm just going to try it i've never tried it before but she was brave and she came on a wednesday wednesday night she tried out the keyboard said this feels fantastic thursday morning she competed and coming out of that preliminary round she was seated first wow and she yeah, she said basically I usually feel exhausted at the end of my program, and now I feel like I could play that program two, three times in a row. Hmm. And so it is not something that's that difficult to adapt to. So, um, yeah, so to answer your question, I think this sense of being flexible and adaptable, um, we don't understand that we have, because in the 18th and 19th centuries, these keyboards were not standardized. Keyboardists went from size to size, they were very flexible, Mm -hmm. but since we had this um, mass production of pianos at the end of the the, uh, 19th century, going into the 20th century, we have actually lost that ability to to understand our own flexibility and adaptability. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so you're saying people are so used to the keyboard as they know it now that they don't have access to or remember a period where actually keyboards could be different. There was this option did used to exist. Right. And so, so what I'm saying is that 
you become a better pianist. You become a, a more flexible and open pianist when you have these experiences of di different size keyboards. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily impractical because actually it teaches pianists a lot. Let's say I have a student who's been practicing on both keyboards mm -hmm. and they're going to a competition that does not have this keyboard. Well, of course, you know, a couple of weeks before, they'll just probably exclusively practice on the conventional keyboard. Right. But, but their practice on the smaller keyboard will have helped them get rid of tension, will have helped them understand their technique better, how to, how to approach the keys in a more beautiful way. It mm -hmm. really does improve the playing. And that mm -hmm. tension and uh, sort of all the negative habits don't flood back when they adjust to a conventional size keyboard? Well, they've learned something new. So, you know, right. if they learn, they won't go back, right? Mm -hmm. and, but the other thing is that even if a college student is not going to ever play a small keyboard again, and they'll never play Rock 3 again except when they were in university, at least they played Rock 3 and they can teach it and they can understand the piece from a point of view of having studied it. Mm -hmm. So if there, it's, a, it's a win all the way around. We're just saying we need to have this alternative. We need yeah. to have this option. Um, and yet we need to have a choice. Because uh, honestly, Jared, I really think it's, there's some, it's not meant to be discriminatory, but there is profound discrimination against pianists with a smaller hand span. Because and the standard keyboard size just uh, makes some of the repertoire, the performance a little more forbidding, not comfortable? Is that, yes. And also, I mean, we have to look at the results of international competitions. Mm -hmm. There have been studies done which show that generally only about 14 to 20 percent of females are prize winners in international competitions. Right. And um, so this I, keyboard size is an opportunity to change that and to recognize other artists. I really think so. I think there are a lot of, um, you know, unrealized careers mm -hmm. because of this size. Right. And, um, you know, I don't think we should be elitist about it to just say, well, this is just an instrument mm. for large hand spans. I actually um, was told that by a, a very prominent professor in Europe one time. He says, well, Carol, there are too mm. many pianos too many pianists in the world already. In other words, let's just keep the numbers down. And you know, my response is, you know, we should have as much beauty in the world as possible. Everyone should be able to play mm -hmm. and make beautiful music and do it without getting injured. Which is so key because there's been um, a lot of talk, especially in the last 20 years in piano didactics and piano pedagogy about how to teach in a way that avoids injury and maximizes virtuosity and effortlessness at the keyboard. And we were watching you play uh, the Schumann list, uh, but also in the same recital, I think you played Chopin Polonaise Fantasy, which has a lot of really treacherous stretches and octaves at the end, right? If you had to play that on a regulation size keyboard, what would your experience be? Well, I did play it, uh, I believe in my graduate studies. Um, and honestly, I never got the sound in the coda that I ever wanted. I was dissatisfied with the result mm -hmm. and never played it again. And um, until I had the, the keyboard. And then when I picked the piece back up, it was just so enjoyable to play. You know, of course, we love the sound of what we do, but it's very important to also love the feeling. Yes. This is a physical thing that we do, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're uncomfortable or in pain, it definitely affects the music making. And, and it doesn't know, you're not going to get the sound that you have in your ear that you desperately want. You know how to do it, but your hands won't do it. Right. Or if you exert them to the point that you injure yourself, then you might on the stage have an incredible moment where you have forced a sound to happen that you, you really dreamed of the sound. But a moment later, you feel it in your hand. There's some negative physical repercussions of forcing the sound out. And here I'd like to highlight something that's very important to me, and that's that you're not just a professor, but that you have played and you also judge in big competitions and you have a musical career outside of the studio. Recently, you were judging in something connected with the Clyburn or at the Clyburn. Is that right? Yes, um, we were 
just we just completed the Clyburn amateur competition. Right. Yes. Which um, it's amazing how mm -hmm. the the world of amateur playing has just blossomed and this. how can competitions then help uh reach out to more musicians than just the like at Paderewski there's a cutoff point it's for professional pro promising professional pianists uh but what was it like at the Clyburn amateur competition what have you noticed about competitions for amateur pianists well they have really honed their skill because there are so many amateur competitions now mm -hmm. Almost, I almost feel a little bit of envy because there are <laughs> pianists my age who are getting to play on concert stages all over the world because of and, and play with orchestras because uh, of this opportunity of the amateur competitions. So you know, uh, many of these pianists um, they they went all the way through conservatories um, and they're very serious pianists and they actually uh, in their jobs probably have more time to practice than many professors like me. Um, <laughs> they're actually practicing four or five hours a day. Um, I'm assuming with the amount of teaching you do, you don't get four to five hours a day on the piano. <laughs> well, even if you have the four or five hours, you're exhausted from teaching, you know. Right. But um, no, it was wonderful. But also, um, you know, I love listening to the amateurs because mm. um, they are they have their own voice you know they they have their a lot of them are older so they have developed their own style and developed the repertoire choices that they love mm -hmm. um and they're not trying to sound like a you know they're they don't have to to get on the concert stage and play so many concerts per year mm -hmm. so they're they're playing what they love uh only and of course they're probably not learning nearly as much repertoire as a professional pianist, but right. um, but they spend a lot of time with their repertoire. They they are honing their skills and um, you know really offering something unique. Each one of them. So the term amateur can sometimes have a negative connotation about the level of playing, but there's also something personalized in it. It's almost like the number of keyboards and the dimensions of the keyboards narrower and wider and narrower and so on could expand to give options for what keyboard playing really means. And also the definition of amateur and professional could expand to include some new understanding of what it means to be an amateur. Yes, I think so. You know, and uh, the, the president and CEO of the Clyburn Foundation, he says basically the amateur competition is for anyone who does not receive their primary income from playing concerts. Right. So, I mean, that's, that, there are quite a few wonderful pianists out there who have other careers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, sometimes people just simply don't want to travel around and play yeah. concerts. For their it's career. exhausting, isn't it? I mean, you know <laughs> exactly what it's like. The concert life is difficult if you're making your career on that. Can you tell us your thoughts on that? You know, honestly, I always wanted to be a college professor. That was my goal. Right. I actually wanted to become the very best concert pianist I could in order to become the very best piano professor that I could be. Hmm. I, you know, I just wanted to be a teacher from the time that I was a very, very small child. I did not know that about you. Yeah. yeah. I love sharing my uh, passion about what uh, I discover in the music you know, with others, not only on the stage, but there's something for some people, there's something still limited about that because you're not able to actually stop in the middle of the piece and say, wasn't that an amazing moment? But, you know, so of course you, you, it just depends on the personality of the person. But for me, it's not enough just to quietly make music and not be able to discuss it share it mm -hmm. um you know in in on a one-on-one -on -one setting with another person is right it, so you love what you do then absolutely love it yes and, and you're running a piano department which must include a lot of different things like administration and organization and guest artistry i mean you do a lot of liaising i know that very well yes well 
it's, uh, you know, it's an honor to have um, some important work to do like that because, you know, you're, you're really leaving a legacy at the university when you can do that. Mm -hmm. But it is, you know, it can be a sacrifice sometime mm -hmm. to do administrative work, of course. But you still get chances to play? Yes. I um, love playing uh, chamber music in particular mm -hmm. these days. And I have some wonderful colleagues that I can play with. That's wonderful. So I have a trio uh, with the Aaron Boyd and Andres Diaz, mm -hmm. violinist and violinist. And, um, you know, that... Those are highlights for me right now, was to be able to play with them. So just one quick question to finish. As competitors are advancing into the finals and they're going to have to adapt to playing with a large orchestra and eventually there will be some prize winners who have tons of concerts, what type of advice do you usually give to people entering the profession as concert players? Well... <laughs> That is kind of a tough question because it's so open. It's just like, okay, it, in what regard? What kind of advice? Um, I know that what has gotten some competition winners into trouble is, first of all, um, having too many concerts uh, on their plate too soon. Hmm. So it depends on the, the, the age of the pianist and the experience and their level of or their quantity of repertoire. So if you put an 18 or 19 year old out to play 50, 100 concerts per year and they don't have that depth of repertoire, they don't have that maturity, that, that can be a serious problem. So I would mm -hmm. say it just depends on the person. So just being very, very careful to, you know, Young people, even a 30-year-old, still needs time to develop. And if you're being asked to play pieces in a short period of time that you haven't already learned, mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a big demand. But I think that's wonderful advice to be, and for audiences too, to know that laureates of competitions are sometimes entering the profession very young, and it's a daunting responsibility to win a competition prize that has with it 20, 30, sometimes 40 even concerts and management coming at them and huge demands on them. At very early in a career, I mean, 30 years ago, uh, it wasn't that there was more time to develop into a pianist before that kind of responsibility was put on your shoulders. Exactly. And of course, you know, to suddenly have such criticism too. Mm -hmm. um, the minute that you are a competition winner and, you know, you're touted to be at this level, the pressure becomes insane yes. because now you're going to be compared to others and you're going to be criticized heavily, even though you might be praised as well. Mm -hmm. You know, young people are really going to take the criticism to heart. Yeah. I think those are beautiful words and they're wise words from a very experienced teacher and someone who knows the business and teaching. So, Carol, thank you very much for being with us at the Paderewski Competition Studio. It's been a real pleasure and thank you for your interest in, in my passion topic with the keyboards too. I really appreciate that. Thank you for sharing it with us. I think it may have really helped people to get a deeper perspective on what that's all about and maybe they'll follow up with you. I hope that they do. Yeah. Thank you everyone for for joining us today. Thank you, Carol, for being with us. And we'll see you uh, in the finals in a couple of days after the announcement of the results of the semifinals come out in a few hours from now. We'll be back in the competition studio uh, in two days' time. We'll see you then. The 12th International Paderewski Piano Competition in Bydgoszcz. Live broadcast.
podcast at www.paderewskicompetition.pl Są takie chwile w życiu, które zostają w pamięci. Gdy dźwięki otaczają nas z każdej strony, muzyka przytula. Najważniejsze, by ten czas spędzać z kimś, kogo kochamy. Lubimy, szanujemy, w miejscu, które jest dla nas czymś ważnym, do którego zawsze chcemy wracać. Harmonia Pomorska. Daj się przytulić muzyce. Możesz budować formy na siłowni i grać niesamowite solówki. Możesz oddać się pasji gotowania i miksować ścieżki. Możesz pielęgnować swoje rośliny i trygować chórem. Możesz uwieczniać piękne momenty i występować na wielkich scenach. W Akademii Muzycznej w Bydgoszczy stawiamy na Twoją swobodę i rozwój. Dlatego dołącz do nas i poczuj, że naprawdę możesz.
Bydgoszcz, the capital and the largest city of the Kujawian Pomeranian region. It is a city of two rivers, the Vistula, the Burda and the historic Bydgoszcz Canal. Picturesquely located between forests, it was associated with water from the very beginning. Water is one of the city's elements, and the old granaries standing by the Burda River tell about its past and the identity of its inhabitants. A remarkable object on the map of Bydgoszcz is the 18th century Bydgoszcz Canal. It contributed to a rapid development of trade and industry, and it associated its residents with the traditions of the skippers and inland navigation forever. The canal, along with the Vistula and Burda River, is a part of the international E-70 waterway connecting Western Europe with the historic Krulewiec. The revitalized Roder's Mills on the Mill Island have become a place of cultural gatherings and concerts. The Mill Island itself is a vibrant heart of the city that offers world-class entertainment, not only in Opera Nova, but also in a picturesque natural setting on the stage built on the Burda embankment. The city can be explored by boats or by a solar boat. From the water level, we can see even more clearly how the past connects with the present and modernity. The living museum created on the renovated Lemara barge tells about the traditions of skippers. From the marina of Bydgoszcz, we can set out in a canoe on a river journey around the city. The monuments of hydraulic engineering can be visited from the picturesque bicycle paths. And in the evening, you can rest in one of the multiple restaurants located by the Mwynówka River. Come. See. Feel it. Dzień za dniem, noc za nocą. Nasze życie upływa pod bezkresnym niebem. Marzymy o rzeczach wielkich, ale życzymy sobie rzeczy prostych. Myślami wybiegamy do przodu, ale jesteśmy świadomi, że życie toczy się tu i teraz. Spoglądamy w niebo z dobrego miejsca na ziemi. Grand Piano.